What's up everybody? Yost the Coast is here, waiting on Steven from Dogwood Handcrafts. Hope you guys are having a good evening. Getting ready to get the interview underway. Speak of the devil, we've got some people showing up now. Waiting for him to join now. Good to see everybody joining. Hey. How's it going? What's going on? Man, our lighting is like polar opposites. You've got dark and mysterious, and I've got super bright. <laughs> yeah, this is in our um, our little soap laboratory here. Uh, here's, and um, it's, yeah, we have everything sp spooky lit. We have a, uh, a gun that shoots uh, spider webs. Oh, yeah? Thing, and uh, it's crazy. <laughs> I have to admit, I like it. It looks super cool. Now, is that in your house, or where is that? Yeah, um, this, if we were like a normal family, would be the dining room, uh, and we're on my dining room table, which is where we have all the, um, all the soap cooking stuff, but uh, yeah, it's just in my house. That looks cool. I super like it. I like how you said normal family. Well, I consider you normal, because if you see my bathroom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ours is a little more understated. We have, we have two, um, like, dedicated shaving bathrooms, basically, and- uh, okay. There's stuff everywhere, but it's not as nicely on display as yours is. It's a more well, with my OCD, I always have to try and make sure everything's nice and nice and straight before I start. Yeah, <laughs> I like to I like to display it a little bit. But we got a good group coming now. Some people have started, so why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself, how you started, where you're from, and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you have absolutely no idea who I am, my name is Stephen Joyner. I uh, run a company called Dogwood Handcrafts, and primarily my thing is uh, shaving brushes for wet shaving, obviously. Uh, I live in Atlanta, just outside of Atlanta, in a suburb called Tucker, and uh, I've been in the artisan biz for, it'll be five years this summer. So okay. Time flies, yeah. Um, I got started working on... Um, straight razors and doing kind of restoration stuff and uh, I was really drawn to the woodworking aspect of it more so than really anything else and so that's kind of where I've where I've stuck uh, lately so okay so how long have you been doing brushes are you still doing are you doing uh, razor restores at all anymore um I do rescales for okay. clients and sometimes for new ones but all I, you know, I still have all my metalworking stuff, but all my honing gear I've, I've passed on because I, I just really don't like that aspect of it. And, sure. uh, and there's people that are so good at it that really deserve to have all that, you know, all that activity and business and whatnot. Um, so the, the, I guess brush stuff, maybe three years I started, two to three, two to three years, I guess when somebody randomly asked me like, hey, can you make a brush to match my razor? And uh, that's, you know, kind of where it started and got got uh, taken off from. Kind of got carried away. Yeah. <laughs> well, my question is now, I don't know much about artisan brush makers. <clears throat> I own a couple, none from you yet, yet. But uh, the ones I do own, and I, I look at their work and I see the prices they charge and I see them doing these drops. Uh, I noticed you do drops, but you also do custom work. Uh, not everybody seems to do that. Is there a reason why you still do custom work? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I started off doing custom only. Like, I had an Etsy page where you would go in and create a brush with Etsy's. Etsy only gives you two parameters So uh, for, for customization. So I would have, like, not diameter and the color or something like that, you know. And then I had to have a separate listing for every type and everything. And... Um, and the, the problem that I had with just strictly customization is you very, very quickly build up a huge queue if you're doing good work and you're in demand. And so I know, you know, lots, lots of other people start off doing that because maybe because all the other brush guys aren't doing customs. And so there's, sorry, I have a lot of dogs. Uh, so there's a lot of demand for customs. And so new people will come in and take all the, you know, all the, all the demand for the customs. And, uh, 
so now I switched to my own site offering the customs and it was just um I had a like a three month waiting period at one point and wow. I'm when somebody would order until the time that I could even start on it because I had so many in the queue and I can't do, you know, I can bulk process some things, but sure. process is extremely detailed and intricate. And so I can't do, I can't be finishing multiple things at once, just the way that I've, I've um, created this process. So sure. for me, I, I was like, I'd rather just make the things that I want to make and get this pressure lifted off of me. Because when you have, when you're sitting on like 30 orders that have already been paid for and you're getting daily emails of people asking you where their thing is, there's only so many hours a day that you can work and sure. I, I have a normal job and then just do this for fun and uh, like side money, I guess. So it was just too much stress. So I went to the drops only, but I was still getting tons and tons of requests for the customs and um, it, I felt like it made sense. I could charge a little bit more. <laughs> for the custom as a service and then the people that were willing to you know kind of wait longer to uh longer than you know on a, on a drop you get your order ship that day but for a sure time, you have to wait till i make it and um so people seem to be happy Whoa. with that compromise of having some things ready on hand and then people that are willing to wait a little bit longer and pay a little bit more uh so I, does that answer your your question? No, absolutely. You actually you actually answered a couple of them in one in your whole answer because I was going to ask you if you did it full time, um, and then I was going to ask you, like I said, why? Yeah. <laughs> and I, so no, that's good. And like it said, it shows that you still are willing to do the customs, but you know people have to realize it's going to take time. Yeah. And you got to make it worth your while as well. Yeah, exactly. And you know, there's there's people that still do strictly custom only and uh, I have a ton of respect for them. It's just a, a big thing for me is um, if, I, if I'm getting too stressed out by this as a business, then it kind of lowers my motivation to do it. And so I, I wanna do it on terms that, you know, are beneficial for me and for all the customers. And just having that huge waiting period, uh, you know, especially if you're taking money up front, it's really stressful and it- Oh, I can imagine, yeah, there's a lot of expectation behind it. Yeah. Now, a few other questions, obviously, regarding, I've got so many questions. I'm trying to, to, oh, to not overwhelm you. <laughs> no, no, no. And a lot, a lot of these are from the people, too, who we asked earlier, too. But um, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of new brush turners always seem to start off with, like, the Harbor Freight Lays, and yeah. they kind of slowly graduate up to the better brands and the better tools. Um, how much of that is just getting to a point where you think you need it? Like, are you limited based on the lower end equipment? Why do you need to jump up? Is it reliability? Yeah, that's a good question. I started on the Harbor Freight lathe. Uh, I still have it in case my expensive one dies <laughs> or if uh, I want to do something, uh, you know, while I'm not using my expensive one. But, you know, um, it's, it's kind of like there's, there's needs and there's nice to haves. And the hard mm -hmm. with the simple tools, whether you're using um, high-speed tools or uh, carbide tools, it's um, it's all you need. You know, like I I created my entire I guess my entire business on that hybrid freight lathe, and it was only when I moved to this uh, this new place where I have my huge workshop and everything, and I was like, okay, I'm going to be doing this for a while, so I can kind of splurge. And really, the only reason I bought a nicer lathe was that I wanted fully variable control, the Harbor Freight Lake, okay. five um, distinct speeds. But for sure. since I do a lot of um, finishing on the lathe rather than off the lathe, uh, it benefits me to have fully uh, variable control. And that was really the only reason I got it. You know, there was nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that lathe. And for the price, I mean, you can get it for like 150, 175 bucks with their coupon. It's outstanding. Now, granted, I went through three of them because I burned them out because <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was a lack of maintenance or if they're just not made super great, which is probably what it is. But yeah. But so if if you're if you're planning on doing you know if you're just making a couple brushes a month, there's no reason not to. But I, you know the not, the new one is really really nice and having that little dial where you can set your RPM to whatever you want is great. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. No, I, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm in kind of construction maintenance type stuff, so I know it's like to have the right tools for the job or the good tools for the job. 
But that's yeah. kind of what I was curious to go from a from a turning standpoint. You know, were you were you looking for the same thing? Like when as soon as you said the variable speed, you know, obviously that makes complete sense because you're yeah. limited to what the what the tools can do. But if you're, you know, say you're you're starting, you know, most guys start off either doing just wood brushes or just acrylic brushes, right? And for the acrylic, you only need two speeds. You're very low speed for drilling and you're very high speed for turning. And then you can sand and polish depending, you know, on the, on the actual material on your low speed and your high speed or use the middle one. And then for your wood, uh, you have your very low speed for truing and then your very high speed for turning and then finishing your, if you're just doing all wood, uh, you can finish off the lathe. And so the variable speed really is, a, it's a luxury at that point, not really a necessity. And, um, and I, you know, I got by, I did maybe two or 300 brushes on, on the three Harbor Freights that I had. And, uh, the biggest, honestly, the biggest quality of life increase for me was getting nicer turning tools and nicer sharpening equipment. So. Sure. Now, when it comes to your hybrid brushes, um, I, I think I saw yours first, at least yours caught my eye first. <clears throat> and from the word on the street, if you want to call it, everyone says, if you want a hybrid brush, Go to dogwood. That's where it's where it started. That's where the quality is. That's where they really shine. What makes you so? What makes yours stand out? Now, granted, I've seen them, so they speak for themselves. Yeah. But what makes your quality stand out? Um, why does making your own casts, you know, make it, why is that an advantage? Yeah, sure. I mean, so when I it, when I got started on the on the hybrids in general the only you could buy hybrid material online and people were already working with it right and most of the people that were working with it would buy the blanks from either a like a big blank company or a small blank artisan and there's and there's tons of them and the I, so i started off and i used a couple from a local shop that were hybrids they were very very simple it would just be like a plain maple wood with a single color in the resin and honestly looking back it's not crazy different from what a lot of the things that I've done, but um, it was it's limiting, right? Because you're limited by what is the material that they actually use. They're making them in huge bulk uh, things. Yeah. If you want to get um, like a certain appearance of the color, you obviously can't do that. If you're looking for a certain shape of the um, of the the figuring and the wood and everything, like if you want to get that nice like mountainous look, or if you want to get a nice flat look or something, you have to handle each each one individually and pick it out. And with brushes, sure. I, in my opinion, it's very important to hide uh, the, the entirety of the knot cup such in the, in the hybrid material, because when, where it cuts into the clear, it's a huge, um, like a visual disruption for me. And so yeah. I need to drill into the wood far enough to fit that whole knot without it poking through the top of the wood. And so that makes a, lot sense. Of, a lot of those factory ones, they would use a very thin piece of burl for the bottom and so the you're not if you're if you're doing a 15 to 20 millimeter knot hole, which is pretty pretty normal, it's uh, a lot of times going to poke through. But the biggest thing was the colors, you know, and the price of the material is is completely outrageous. For a brush size piece, you pay like twenty dollars for a blank. Sure. And the actual cost of the materials, neglecting the labor, is much less. And so if you buy all that yourself, it's it's cheaper. But yeah, I mean. That, that that's the big advantage the price uh fully customizing the color and knowing what material is being used so that you can have your advantage with turning and finishing because the different acrylic materials handle very differently on the lathe and they handle differently depending on how you finish them wow I mean, there's, there's so many factors that go into that now when you're doing casting do you guys do you have to put it like in a, in a vacuum to remove air bubbles or do you ever really have that issue um, so I use for my uh, for my hybrids I use alumalite resin, which is a um, polyurethane resin rather than a polyester resin, and so okay. it's cast under pressure rather than under vacuum. Okay. Uh, yeah, essentially you squeeze the air down until it's microscopic, and then when the resin sets, the air is unable to expand. So that's yeah, it's. So yeah, it is done. It is done under pressure. The big downside to that is, once it goes in the pot, uh, I don't see it until it's cured. And so if there's some kind of problem, like uh, a big problem I have, I have three dogs and two cats in the house. And so a lot of times, if I'm not paying attention, I'll get a hair in the resin. And I will. Yeah. It's not always easy to see it. You know, I have like 
the when the blanks come out you I look in to see if there's any like okay did any dirt or anything get in there and if it's a hair you don't always see it until you're at the very very end when you're done and then it'll sure. be obvious so oh that's, man that's a downside that's a real world problem though <laughs> I, I i have a, a i mean i have a whole bucket full of failed blanks where it's either like dog hairs or some kind of like particulate or something i try to keep the area as clean as i can and a lot of times my girlfriend would come downstairs and I'm casting with no clothes on because I don't want the hair from my clothes. <laughs> That's an image. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've ruined so many just from, you know, either bad luck or stupid mistakes that I, I know what I, what I have to do to prevent it. So. Well, that, that's good. And, no, I know you and I have talked prior to the interview because, like I said, I've entertained the idea of getting a brush from you because every time I see one, I have to stop and look. Yeah. So let's say I'm obviously I'm going to get one from you. It's it's going to happen. So, but from a from a person who has not even touched base with you yet, and they want to reach out to you, they want to make a custom brush. <clears throat> let's say that like you, like, like I did, I kind of already knew what colors I wanted, and you pretty much already knew what I was expecting. What is something like that? By the time I send you money and the brush is in my hand, what's your turnaround time for a custom brush? You know, I'm sure it varies based on, you know, how many orders you have. But what's your average? Um, okay, so lately the customs have pretty much just been, um, they, they're available during the drive, right? There's like the pre-made brushes and the custom brush slots. And those I get started on the same day. Now, if I, if I, if somebody requests a color of dyed wood, like, so the, the plain one is just the, the plain maple color. And then, you know, I have all the different dyed ones. So this is a green. And so that adds time to the process because if I have tons of the, of each ready to go, but maybe, you know, maybe like four people order blue and I only have three blue blanks. So I have to get started on making the blue and that, that takes a certain amount of time. So generally I have all the wood dyed and ready to go within, you know, three days and I can cast the blanks and get started on, so the Wednesday or Thursday after a drop. And so the, the first, I go in the order that I get them, right? So the first person to order a custom is usually getting theirs within a week. And the last person oh. is usually getting theirs within two weeks. Right now, I'm a little more backed up because I had more custom spots than normal. And then I had some, there's all kinds of, working with natural material, there's all kinds of weird things that can happen. So I had a batch of wood that randomly it's the same as like from the same block of wood, the, on the left half of it, it's fine. And on the right half of it, it repels all of the dye and you can't dye it. It's really strange. It has this huge variation in density. And so I've had to like experiment and try to figure out um, which parts of the wood I can actually use for the colors that I need. But yeah, I'd say like one to three weeks is what I quote. And okay. it, it, it really depends on, you know, like if it was just you and me right now, uh, I'm pretty much done with customs and I'm just preparing for the, um, uh, the meets that are taking place over the summer, then I could have something turned around in, you know, like three days, but that's very uncommon. So <laughs> somebody, I'm reading the comments real quick. And I, yes, I know you didn't answer this, but somebody said, can you tell them again where you live? Okay. Yeah. So I, I live in Tucker, which is a, a suburb in Atlanta, just outside the city. And um, I've lived here for 26 years, or in this area for 26 years. And before that, I was born in Alabama and moved here. So, Okay, perfect. I was laughing at somebody earlier, too, because you were talking about your dog hair. So now we're calling you dog hair crafts, hand crafts. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so according to, you, like, you know, there's other brush makers who are making similar hybrids. Um, there's other brush makers making different kinds, but you know, like I said, every handle is a little bit different. This is a Wild West Brush Works. This is a Turtle Ship Shape Go. Both completely different, but you know, both the same general shape. So my yeah. question to you is, is, is there some kind of like unwritten rule about not trying to copy other brush makers' handles? Do you guys try and be unique? You know, is, what's the deal with that? Yeah, I think that's, a, I mean, that's a great question and something I'm sure a lot of customers wonder about because if you are, 
so say we're back in the custom space. If you're offering customization as an option and someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, I really like this shape of handle that somebody else does, but I just can't get one of theirs. Will, will you make it? And I went through that exact same thing with straight razors. You know, there's people that would say, hey, this guy makes thousand dollar razors. I can't afford that. Can you make me the same thing for 200 bucks? And it's like, uh, you know, but it, just as far as the, your shape and material and stuff, I, I, I try to avoid it, right? There's some things where if somebody says, will you make me a white one? Okay, well, you know, how many white brushes have been made over the decades? Lots, right? But if somebody sure. says, you make me this exact, these colors, and then make it in the shape of something that's very iconic, then it's, you start to move into that gray area where, where then if someone says, okay, will you duplicate this other person's work? Exactly, you know? Like uh, a really common one is um, declaration grooming, right? Who I, I a like a gold standard of quality and consistency and he has a lot of uniqueness to his designs and so he has come out and said i don't mind if people use my shape and colors and things like that because he has enough business on his own to you know like it, it's not going to affect it and so you know people ask me hey can you make like a a declaration copy and I say, if it's okay with Scott, then I don't mind. It's not my preference, but if, you know, if that's what you're paying for and he's okay with it, then, you know, that's fine. But, you know, if I'm out looking for new ideas for, you know, if, or if I see something that somebody else does, generally my instinct is to avoid, uh, avoid copying it or lifting it. Like I'm not looking, going through all the brush makers, Instagrams, and saying like, oh, that was a great idea. I should copy that and then I can make a bunch of money. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to be known sure. for uniqueness and um, exclusivity where you are getting something that you can only get from me, I guess. That has always been my goal. But, um, you know, there is, there's a moral component to it of how, how far you're willing to go down the path. Like, for example, um, the Simpson shapes, like the Simpson Chubby or the Rubber Set 400. These are iconic, classic, um, that are tied in with vintage designs. And I make chubbies all day, every day, because everybody has a chubby design, you know? Sure. And I don't think that it, it's difficult to compare Simpson with like the little guys like, like us, you know? It's like, it's not the same as um, the, the, like the named designs that uh, Peter from Wolf Whiskers has, you know? Like all his designs have a certain they're called or Bob from elite. They're all named something that he's come up with and they're like unique and repeatable and you can readily identify them. I try to avoid any moving into that kind of territory. I, I don't know if I hit all your questions. No, 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 that was good. That was interesting. Um, I'm going to jump out of sync real quick because I saw a comment earlier. I didn't want to miss it. Josh asked you, are there no more TSM razors? No, that was a one-time thing. Uh, I think somebody okay. else. Okay. Well, then that, that, that kind of, you know, that kind of is what I was looking for. It's about the copying thing. And then also when you're making your handles, do you do, do you shape it by eye, by hand? Do you have a guide, a caliper? Do you use something to make sure it's right? Like, or is this all done freehand? Yeah, no, it's all freehand. Um, at this point, it's really just muscle memory. Uh, for the hybrids, I used to have, or for, for every, um, for the customs, I would do a new shape every time. And people started complaining because it wasn't what was in the picture of sure. And so I had to redo at least a dozen and get the old ones back or they would keep the old one depending, you know, if they're international, I'm not going to bother with it. And um, so that was, it's, it's annoying because you want to be creative and innovate and stuff like that. Like I don't, it's not pleasurable to me if I had to make the exact same thing, say like size, color, shape every single day. But ultimately, people see on Instagram or Facebook, for example, they see that brush. They want that exact brush. And sure. at the end of the day, if that's something you've created uh, there's, and there's demand for it, you kind of, are, you know, you do have an obligation to deliver it. So um, I'm getting off track of what he asked exactly. Um, what can you, sorry, can you remind me? <laughs> No, no, no. I was just saying, like, how are you making your handles? Like, were you doing it? Like you said, you answered a muscle memory. Okay, so for, for the hybrids, I pretty much do this, the, more or less the same shape. 
Um, there is some variance in, obviously there's natural variation in the material. And so if it's like, like this is relatively flat on the hybrid piece. And so yeah. I, I can make, I could make this top portion pretty short and I still get the full color or I can make it pretty long and I still get the full color. So depending on what that customer wants, I can make it a more elongated one, like the ones you showed, or maybe a little, little shorter one. But um, there, there's limitations with this. Like I told you about the, um, the knot has to, you have to have a minimum amount of wood in order to conceal the knot. And so that sure. means no matter what, I have to have at least a certain length of brush. And so that means that there's some designs that just aren't feasible with that material. Whereas if I'm working with an all acrylic piece, that opens up a lot more possibilities because of course. you can make it an inch long and it wouldn't matter because the thing is still concealed or whatever else. So, um, and then there's things like uh, with the cast objects, um, it, it, it looks more visually appealing to have, if you have two layers, it can be nice to have a sharp cut off. And so I'll kind of like make that cut and then shape the two independently of each other or sometimes, so I have this one, which is going to be part of my next release, where it has the clear portion with the meteorite in the bottom. I don't know how yeah. It. And then the top is the acrylic, and they're seamlessly blended here. But then compare that to the Jurassic Park ones. I love cool. that. I love that when you posted that today. This is a this is a very firm, like, you know, and that's by design, obviously, because it's supposed to replicate the thing from the movie. So this is yeah. a very sharp delineation. And so the rest of the design for me, kind of just naturally comes out of that. But I don't, no, I don't use guides or templates or any kind of like CNC or anything like that. It's all just um, how it naturally comes out. That's incredible. Now, um, would you say that you started hybrid brushes or you kind of popularized them? Um, I, I would have to qualify that a lot. I don't think started. I think I... I definitely made them more popular and more mainstream. And in, in my opinion, I was the first person who was making or who was like had readily available custom hybrid material, like homemade okay. material, because the, re the ready-made hybrid material has existed for years. And there's, there's people that um, that's all they use, you know, and I, sure. I wanted to, A, like I said before, have the, cost savings and uh, the creativity uh, freedom. So, um, no, you know, I don't, I don't lay any particular claim or try or claim, I don't claim to have the claim on the material or having started it. Um, I think that it's, I think I helped popularize it, but you know, my, I've only had a f like less than a thousand customers and um, I have like 1200 Instagram followers. So, you know, realistically, in the grand scheme of things, I no, I get you. But in our in our little dysfunctional group of uh, you know of wet shapers, you know, I see a lot of your dogwood brushes, and then I, I start seeing other ones, and I'm like, oh, it's got to be dogwood. I'm like, oh no, it's so and so, or it's this person. So, and then, like I said, I'm not saying they're necessarily copying you, but it, you know, they're trying to to you know take advantage of what's popular and what's hot right now, and they're so unique and not a single one of the same. And it seems like no matter what you post, I want it. Regardless yeah. if it's a color I don't like or not, it's just like, damn, that thing is beautiful. Yeah, you know, you try to give someone the benefit of the doubt if um, if they're making something similar versus something that's, like, suspiciously similar. But I think, you know, the material appeals to people. If you go to any wood turning shop, at which you might be surprised how many, like, wood turning woodworking shops there are, they have hybrid material there next to all the wood and the acrylic. And so you can very easily get it. But you, you know, you either stick with that or you want to overcome the limitations of it. And, um, and I, I fully admit that there is a very large untapped market for this because I turn away dozens of people every week so saying, sorry, I just don't have time to do more customs right now. And so wow. it's kind of like, you know, I, it's, it's a lot like, in my opinion, the, um, I don't know, you, you've been about shaving, what, like two years, you said? About three years. Three years. Okay. So back in the day it, around that time, the only artisan soap maker using duck fat was Bufflehead. Mm -hmm. And he was on a, a drop model that was, it was very infrequent, you know, less than once a month, maybe once every other month. And it was um, between like 20 and 30, 25 and $30, I think for the soap. 
And, um, but people ranted and raved about how great it was and that this ingredient is what made it so great. And so then suddenly lots of other artisans started using duck fat. Now, some of them admitted, yes, I'm doing this because there's none available and there's a huge demand for it. And then the other side of that is, oh, I'm using it because I believe it's the best ingredient and I believe it has a lot to offer independent of what any other company is doing. Sure. And, and you know, it's, I find one of those a little more believable than the other, but I, I think it's the same thing with the hybrid. You know, there's people that might say, well, hey, you know, Steven's not making enough brushes and so I'm gonna make some because there's money to be made here or there's sure. people unsatisfied with the quantity of product. And the other side of that is, oh, I believe this is a truly beautiful material and it, I can use it in a way to express myself. Thank you. So, and you know, you want to give people the benefit of the doubt and that they're doing it for like pure artistic reasons, but at the same time it is business. And so, you know, if, if there's demand, then supply will follow. Sure. Absolutely. So now like you were kind of touching on it, there's, there's kind of phases or fads that kind of go through our little group here. And like, you know, I think a lot of things I've noticed recently too are the gel tips on like badger brushes or, or the hook tips. And I'm not trying to say hybrid brushes are a fad, but they're very in, they're very popular right now. So do you see yourself perfecting and maybe evolving from the hybrid? What do you see down the line? Do you have creative ideas to try and stand out and continue being relevant? What do you want to be doing a year from now? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm, honestly making fewer hybrids than ever in terms of a ratio of, of everything that I do, it used to be a hundred percent. And then I started, would say, you know, I'd really like a brush that's like uh, black and blue or like white and blue or whatever, but all the blanks online that you can buy and then turn, I don't like how they are. And so I would make acrylics. It was mostly just for friends. You know, I've never had a custom acrylic um, listing that I can remember. And so then, you know, so then the, the ratio is changing, right? Like it's fewer hybrids, a little more acrylics. And now I, um, I've really enjoyed doing the, the cast objects. So the first cast object I ever did was the, um, the mosquitoes and the amber. And, yeah. Uh, but that's a, that's a very logical one that, you know, it's like, okay, if you want Jurassic Park brush, it has to be, it has to be that. So, but then you get into like, okay, what else could I put in there that would be interesting, you know? And uh, sure. so I've had, uh, I had a friend who is a good, um, who's like a, you know, previous customer, but also a longtime friend in the community. And he's really, really, his thing is he collects straight razors. And so I took an old straight razor and I cut it down and I, I cast it in acrylic, like the sword in the stone. Oh, no kidding. Coming out of the knot area in the clear. And that went super well. And so ever since then, I've just been, you know, trying more and more things. And um, so like the, like the meteorites I get from a, uh, a customer who is a dealer of like jewelry and minerals and antiquities and things like that. And so he sends me the meteorites and fossils and all kinds of like, uh, like I have these um, bismuth crystals that don't show up great. It's, they're the rainbow metal uh, crystals. That's so cool. Yeah, and then I have um, some some super rare meteorites. They were like super expensive. I have um, uh, megalodon teeth that I'm working on. No, not megalodon. What's it? mosasaur teeth, which was the giant okay. whale shark thing from Jurassic. Yeah. Um, and then I have the regular shark teeth. Uh, I've done you know like dice. I've done. I've worked on guitar picks. Uh, you know all kinds of things. So I've I've enjoyed the. Um, like starting to gain the reputation of like the mad scientist who's yeah. casting objects. So I think that's kind of like the logical area I've expanded into, but, but otherwise, you know, I, so I have the, the Jurassic stuff that I think really sets me apart. Nobody else does that. And it's extremely difficult. And I, you know, I'd be surprised if there was a huge resurgence of that, the hybrid thing where um, I have, you know, fully customizable, full range of colors and, and everything and then the cast stuff. And from there, I'm not sure where I'd go, to be honest. Um, I, well, I, don't, I don't think I'm as great at doing the pure acrylic ones. And that's, it's so saturated. I really don't, don't want to get further into that. They're fun no. as they take so much less time than anything else I do because the finishing is so easy. But 
you know, there's, there's a million other people you can go to for it. So it's harder for me to stand out uh, among, among that group. No, I understand, but with you casting and doing the custom casting and trying to be like the mad scientist, that's cool. That's promising. You've got some cool ideas, and the, and the possibilities are endless. Uh, I've been staring at Luton Brushworks' question for the past five minutes. I'm sure you saw it. Are you drinking badger water? <laughs> Do you know what that's in reference to? Uh, a little birdie told me a, ref a story about you drinking some bloom water or some brush water or something. So... It's, it's a common practice to soak a badger brush before you use it, right? And, um, and I've always done that. But what I didn't know, so I, I did that, and then I drank the water as a joke. Now, a lot of people thought that that was a serious, I was doing a serious review of the brush. This was the Declaration B5, which is my favorite um, brush to use of all time. Anything from that batch is just outstanding. And um, so as a joke, because I like to do, I don't know, I like to do like funny things or sometimes trolly things. <laughs> water. Not A, not realizing how disgusting it was, and B, not realizing that air coming out of China is treated with a, um, a pesticide to kill um, lice. And um, it's basically like, we call it anthrax powder. And... Um, so I didn't realize that it's like potentially dangerous, but I said, oh yeah, this is great. There's so many health benefits. There's all the protein from the keratin and everything. And it's just like great for your teeth and your hair. And there was- And you almost died from it? <laughs> there was a question where a lot of the grumpy old people were like, this guy is going on about these medical claims and I just don't think there's any evidence for it. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> no kidding, dude. It was a joke. <laughs> I'm drinking badger water. It's a joke. <laughs> I did it the one time, and I, I, if I think about it, I want to vomit. And so <laughs> I, I thought about it tonight to reprise my glory, but it's so disgusting. Don't do it. Throw the badger water out, or if you're going to drink it, mix in some alcohol or something. <laughs> disgusting. I'll but, take your word for it. I'm good on that. <laughs> yeah. This is a new concoction. This is soap water. And so you take your proto lather out of your tub and dump it into your water. And this, it what? It get, you get all the benefits of the post shave feel in your mouth. We think about the outside of our face a lot. I get really dry skin. My head gets really flaky, but I get dry mouth a lot too. And so when you ingest that nice, like the shea butter, the coconut oil, the jojoba oil, the argan oil, it just, I'm salivating like crazy right now. Yeah, I kind of figured he was crazy. <laughs> I'm like, if that's what your soap water looks like, I don't want to use the soap. <laughs> well, we have, um, we have, you know, you have your pigmentation that you can put in the soap to turn to different colors. And so this is from that's our, true. Yeah, so here's one of our upcoming bath bars. It's uh, pink and black swirl. So, yeah. So it would. Nice. Make, does it make red water? Uh, no, I didn't use too much. Okay. It, does, it, should be. it still lathers white, I guess, but. Okay. Nice, nice. So for people who, like I said, obviously we've had quite a few people stick around. And, you know, I'm sure you've had a lot of people in the comments, our, our viewers have bought your brushes before. But for the people who haven't, what kind of peace of mind can you give them saying that if they're going to buy a brush from you, what can they expect? What can they expect? Well, I mean, first and foremost, um, I stand 100% behind everything. Um, I've I've never had any issue where if there was if somebody wasn't happy with something uh i always do my best to make it right um but that you know it happens so rarely because i think the designs that I've got are very high quality the materials very high quality i've done a lot of testing on the longevity of it to make sure that it's something that's durable and going to last um but um you know i I work very closely with people during the designing process. A lot of people are fine to just pick colors and then not say anything. And that's perfectly fine. I can work from that. Or there's people who have a very, very high attention to detail. And I have worked with those people before. And, um, I, you know, I, I try to not to be just like a faceless um, person or company that you're like sending money to and hoping that you get something good out the other side. Uh, sure. I, I take a lot of pride in my work. My work is 
really the um, like the it's my entire identity is putting out good work and being you know being recognized for good work and not being seen as like a uh, somebody who's I don't know not doing not doing a good job I guess in what they devote. No, to. I mean anybody with eyes can see your your work speaks for itself. You know that's why I wanted to bring you on. I wanted to get to meet you myself. You know, a lot of people say the interviews are for everybody, but they're for me too. Most of the yeah, times, yeah. I have actually like, spoken, you know, face to face with somebody. So, you know, I'm curious about your brushes. I've talked to you in the past, and I am going to get a brush from you. So that's why I wanted other people to come on. I wanted to pick your brain. I wanted to hear what you what you go through with other brush makers because I'm sure there's stuff that was involved. So, you know, that's all I really had for you today. Is there anything you want us to talk about? Anything you want to plug? I mean, this is your time. The carpet, you know, the floor is yours. Um. Let's see. So the the next, I guess, in like dogwood news, I took the month of May off for drops. Usually I have a, a drop every three to four weeks. My last one was on April 6th. And I'm working on the last custom from that right now. And then building up inventory for the Maggard Razors meet, which is in Adrian, Michigan on June 1st. And so I'll be there with um, at a joint table for dogwood handcrafts and southern witchcrafts which is the company uh, that I run with my girlfriend for making soap, which uh, looks like this. And it might be mirror image. That's cool. And uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll be vendors there where you can come. I'm going to have at least 20, hopefully 30 dogwood brushes for sale at the meet. Wow. And, you know, no wait time or anything like that. Um, and then I'll be there uh, not too far down the line should be Scott from Declaration. And we have a little partnership going where if you buy a handle from me, you get 10% off of his knotting service, which is the best in the world. And I'm not just saying that because we have partnership. I've said that for years. And recently we decided it would be mutually beneficial to collaborate. Um, so anything that is not sold at the meet, I'll list on the website immediately. And then I'm going to get started on the next drop, which um, now that it is uh, spring going into summer, the crane flies are back out, which is what the Jurassic brushes are made from. So I have built up a stockpile of the insects, which are very difficult to acquire unless you catch them yourself. The guy that I used to buy them from has been out for almost two years. So wow. I built up a huge inventory of these. I actually streamed myself catching them in the yard uh, two days ago, which was uh, an event. It was entertaining. <laughs> So I'm gonna be I'm gonna be releasing these as often as I possibly can, um, maybe even outside of drops. And um, let's see. So this one in particular has a really cool story to it that I was hoping to, to plug on here real fast. So yeah, sure. picture. But so normally I'll get a single one of the we call them mosquitoes. They're not actually in the mosquito family. Uh, one of these guys, and put it in the brush like you've seen in the hit. Film Jurassic Park. This one yeah. has two in it, and these two, my girlfriend Courtney, who was here the whole time, um, she Hi, Courtney. she knew that I was looking for them ever since they came back in season, and she spotted these two in a spider web, and they were they they died, were captured in the spider web, and died from the spider, I assume, in the in the like uh, crane flies mate in mid air flying around with their parts, uh, you know, connected. And so yeah. in the spider web while mating and died there together. And so she was able to salvage them together. And I cast them into this, this brush where you can see they're still attached. And so, wow. yeah, it's the, I have pictures and video of this on my Instagram page, uh, dogwood handcrafts. And so I'm going to check it out. <clears throat> these normal ones on, I mean, I get asked about them almost every day year round, but these insects only live for, I think six weeks a year. And so the window, yeah capturing and then making them is very small. And so um, with the, the normal ones I'm, I'm planning on selling, with this one, I wanted to do something special with it other than just like, you know, sell it for a normal amount of money and then just move on. This is probably the last one of these that's ever going to be made because the sequence of events that had to happen for this to be made are very, very improbable. And sure. I'm confident that it'll ever happen again. So, um, I didn't want to have a, we're, we're going to have a fundraiser. I didn't want to have it too close on the tail end of the huge fundraiser uh, that was going on recently for um, John Conley's daughter surgery. I didn't want to get 
on that or anything or in any way because people do get kind of burned out on donating and so of course. i don't want his cause to suffer or ours but um so we're going to be having a huge fundraiser in june where this brush is going to be one of the prizes there's also going to be a, um, a custom declaration brush and maybe even with a choice of hair including discontinued ones which is really cool that's a like um, more like between like one and two thousand dollar value depending on how much they sold in the past wow. and a, a friend has graciously donated a uh, vacation at his condo in Belize for a week so that's a I think he said two thousand dollar value of the wow. uh, yeah. so this is it's we we basically have a um like a medical situation that we're going to be raising money for. But I just wanted to, in case people, a lot of people have been asking where to get this, that's where you can get it. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about it more than maybe you and I can talk about it more than, sure. um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, I'm always looking for if people have cool ideas, like I'm happy to give them credit for it and everything, or if they have something special that they think is really unique that they want to see cast, I could, um, I could work with them on that. But um, yeah, otherwise, if there's any more questions in the little chat, I haven't really even been reading, so. I'm trying to watch, somebody asked about a beard oil. Did you used to have a beard oil, or do you have a beard oil? Um, no, I don't know okay. what he's about. Okay. I know that, uh -huh. I, it's, it's probably an inside joke, but I don't get the joke, so. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, then I have nothing else, but I do want to talk to you, and uh, I'll message you after this, because I, you've definitely sold me, well, you sold me on a brush before I talked to you, but now I'm even more sold, so I'm going to talk to you after this, we're going to get something going, I need to get one of yours. I forgot, I do have something else to show you, I don't know if you've sure. seen my Yes, I heard about that. Yeah, so I'll have this at the meet as well, I'm not planning on selling it, because they discontinued these knots, and so I have one of the last ones that there is. So I was planning on offering these as a service to make them, but like you can't get. I want them. one so bad. <laughs> yeah. now, but though, I'd be happy to let you borrow it and do a shave with it. I shaved my head with it, and it's it's the thing is pillowy soft. I mean, it's the I bet. used, and it's seventy five millimeters, so you can you can fit about you know half a tub of soap in this thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's not. <laughs> It doesn't come across well on the camera, but it is, you know, one of the hybrids. Yeah. Kind of cool. Um, That's amazing. And, um, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Uh, I'm done. I am think we're good. Steven, thank you. Let's talk after this. I'll reach out to you. Guys, anybody else who's looking to look into Southern Witchcrafts or Dogwood Handcrafts, Please look them up. Good soap, good brush maker, fantastic. Thank you, Stephen, for coming on. Let's do this again sometime. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Nice talking to you. Anytime. Have a good night. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate you coming on. Love you all, and I'll catch you later.